What exactly is the human condition? Whenever we think about the human condition, or at least use it as a reference or excuse to think why we think the way we think or do things the way we do, we still understand it as something we all experience, every single person. It's why it's the human condition, mankind. And so realistically, the bond that connects every single person on earth is the unending suffering that is the human condition. It is what separates us from animals or even plants. And so in the end, we think, therefore, we suffer, unfortunately. And while we may be able to understand and accept suffering as a fact of life and in the human condition, it doesn't really answer the question completely. And if we answer the question more, could we potentially relieve our suffering just a little bit? That is what we are here to find out. So once more, what exactly is the human condition? And can we do anything about it? <laughs> One of my favorite potential answers to the question, what is the human condition? comes from a man in 1966, Kenneth Burke, from his Language of Symbolic Action. And in this, he writes the definition of man, to which I say is one of the strongest arguments of what the human condition is, even though he writes it in the most humblest of ways. This is also sometimes called the definition of human, uh, just to be a little less sexist here, but he does use the word man throughout the entire text, pretty much, so we're, we're going to use that today. If I, I hope you don't mind. Burke's definition of man can be seen as five elements that all branch one from the other. And so to begin, man is the symbol using, symbol making, symbol misusing animal inventor of the negative or moralized by the negative, separated from his natural condition by instruments of his own making, goaded by the spirit of hierarchy or moved by the sense of order, and rotten with perfection. All of these elements put together point directly toward perfection, which is truly the heart of all of our suffering as all we want to do is achieve perfection and see the fruitfulness of our potential. But in a true reality, perfection doesn't exist and rarely does life meet our expectations. And so while perfection does not exist, a drive toward perfection does sort of need to be necessary to live or to live life to the fullest as we want a drive and a will to power to do things. But in Burke's essay, he points out that perfection and our drive toward it can often lead to danger. It can be dangerous. And this is why he calls it rotten with perfection, to which I love and use on the regular. And so this is why I'm making the video. So you guys know what the heck I'm talking about. But in Kenneth Burke's idea of rotten with perfection, this is where we find ethnocentrism, racism, sexism, ageism, every single thing where you find an us versus them mentality because one is perfect and the other one is the opposite. And so... <laughs> This is not good. This is the dangerous, rotten side of where perfection can be. But above all, the sense of perfection does make us want to be like everyone else. Like the us versus them we want to be. And truly, this is what's feeding our insecurities of not being perfect. And so as all of these elements of the definition of man do fall from one to the next, I do want to spend just a little bit more time explaining each of them before we get into solving the entire problem of 
the rotten perfection. <laughs> so back to step one, uh, but in a fun way. Let's let's use a movie, right? For today, I thought it would be fun to talk via Nacho Libre, a fantastic Jack Black movie. So let's get into it, shall we? <laughs> So first things first, man is a symbol using animal. Man is the symbol using, symbol making, symbol misusing animal. In reality, this includes every single thing, even every non thing. If there's a thing that isn't physical and more metaphysical, it's still labeled and symbolized with something, namely religions or ideologies or political parties or nations or peoples or anyone, all of these are labels, therefore symbols. And really quick, as we all know, uh, abbreviations are fantastic symbols and we make them almost every single day. You know, OMG, LOL, VHS. We make new words every single day and they always symbolize the the father of their word. So to get into the Nacho Libre of it all. <laughs> the movie Nacho Libre uses two communities that heavily use symbols in their nature, both in clothing or jewelry or itemization, like you know, crosses on the wall, churches and wrestling both have very strong symbols, and ironically, they don't interconnect very well, and that makes for a great movie. But <laughs> as the movie starts, all of the symbology within it is very obvious. First, we see little baby Nacho Libre building his wrestling costume, and then slowly all of the clothes that represent wrestling are stripped away, and soon they are replaced with clothes that represent Christianity. And honestly, this is a fantastic example of how clothes represent exactly who you are, and we truly cannot get away from this. But even in the everyday, what we wear says a great deal about us, and this does go especially so in professional and religious settings like in the movie. For the purpose of Nacho Libre, it is a huge risk for him to get found out as a wrestler because Nacho cannot be wearing symbolic clothes that represent wrestling because they truly do not match the ideals and morality and ethics of Christianity, such as you aren't supposed to wrestle on sacred ground. You aren't supposed to visually represent violence. And as the movie states quite clearly, wrestlers are celebrities that celebrate a false pride. And this is a against the rules in Christianity. But in the end, I am very curious if all of this is why it's called the cloth being a man of the cloth, because you sacrifice everything wearing these clothes, and they mean everything to the outside world. You look at a man in a monk's uniform, you know exactly what that man is about. Or woman, I don't know, you know, the rules. <laughs> Either way, they are a sacrifice that proves your devotion, and so... They symbolize quite a lot. <laughs> the second point in Burke's definition of man is that he is the inventor of the negative or mortalized by the negative. What this means is that we create good and evil, good and bad, do and don't, is and isn't, can't and can't, every single thing, even though numbers on a freaking thermometer or a clock or anything that's measured by humans 
those numbers go up and down, everything has an opposite, we mortalize ourselves. And we can often get around this. Even in Christianity, the I shall not is a somewhat positive, somewhat negative, altogether quasi-negative, to where we are, we are happy to not be something else. And so, in the end, we don't want to be bad, and we do want to be good. And both of those statements have many words that have a positive or negative meaning. And what I love about Nacho Libre in the movie of the same name, um, he's often the king of the gray area and doesn't really point toward a good or a bad. He's like, why not both? And I love that. Love that for him. Some fantastic examples of what Nacho does, for instance, talk back to his authorities, talk and walk sexy with the nun lady, or let alone nuns, walking and talking sexy with a nun. That's a big no-no. Big no-no. Um, but I, I mean, who can blame him? She is gorgeous. So, he's a gray area guy. We know what his intentions are, really. <laughs> but even with all of his lies and deception, uh, which is what actually happens in the movie, in the end, Nacho does show that he cares for the children a lot. And this is a point of morality in that it is good to care for the children. And it would be bad for him to go and say, F, F you guys, I'm going to be a rich wrestler. You know, who needs to work for the orphans? But he was an orphan. He has that empathy to make it even easier to make that decision. And so that is a, a negative that he chooses not to do. There's no other way around that. You got to be the good guy in every situation. But the moral of the story with this element here is that nature does not have a negative. There is no bad or evil in nature. Humans invented it. But what is fantastic is that there is wrestling in nature. You see it all the time. L lions wrestle. They have it. Have fun and games. Though I'm sure they realize that there is a winner and a loser, they do do it for fun and games. And awesomely enough, Na Nacho does too. He's like, oh, the losers get paid? I am officially the happiest guy. Like, we can just do this and, and actually maybe win eventually, but, you know, be financially supported to do it in the meantime. Gotta love financial support. Plug my Patreon real quick. But once again, Nacho Libre is the king of the gray area and does not mind losing wrestling because he does win. And so it's all fun and games. It's all fun and games. The third part of Burke's definition of man is that man is separated from his natural condition by instruments of his own making. And what's fantastic about Nacho Libre is he's a very down-to-earth kind of guy. <laughs> but of course he can't get away with out using tools. Even the tools you use to make those tools, you gotta use them or else you're not using anything. Ever. <laughs> Admittedly, this section is probably going to be the shortest of them all. Because every single thing is a tool. Everything around you, everything you're using, everything you're wearing, the whole clothing part of this video can be copied and pasted right here. Every single thing is a tool, which does separate us from nature, but it also makes it possible for us to live life, you know? Houses are tools. It's winter right now and I could not live without a house so it, it's not a, it's not a bad thing that we're separated by nature by tools is kind of what I'm saying here at the same time tools are also all symbols basically you can't get around a tool being a symbol because we are a very 
socioeconomic mindset kind of society, unfortunately, but let's just move on from that. We all understand things mean things. An example from Nacho Libre is the wrestler's mask. This is a tool that is many uses, but also is many symbols at the same time as well, as it represents who you are as a personality. It also hides who you are. You know, honestly, probably do your own research. I'm the worst uh, resource in this entire field, but the point of the story here is when the bad guy of Nacho Libre takes off Nacho's helmet or mask, it is incredibly dishonorable and disrespectful, and I'm glad he lost, because F that guy, he's a freaking jerk, okay? The absolute worst role model in the world. Other than the type of the role model where you're like, I want to be not that guy, because uh, thank goodness we have bad role models to look up to. I guess. If you're curious what the tools for tools part of this section is, is that you need things in order to create other things. This can even be seen in Nacho Libre as the entire opening is him gathering materials to create something, or later using that as a prototype to make a drawing, which is also a prototype to make the real thing, and in making the real thing, you use other tools to make the costume, like the sewing machine, all that jazz, all the materials. These are tools for other tools. But what I'd like to say is that it all comes down to the hammer and the wheel in that our imagination is our ability to see what could be a tool. And seeing something as a tool for a tool is even a better ability yet. So, short section, but it is very important. Drop the mic. <laughs> the fourth point in Burke's definition of man is that we are goaded by the spirit of hierarchy or moved by the sense of order. And I don't know why I thought the tool section would be the shortest. I didn't look at my script, apparently. This one is the shortest, because who doesn't understand the iron law of oligarchy? We cannot get away from wanting to be better than someone else, above someone else, you know, pressing on, basically, you know, the circle of life, you did it to me, I want to do it to you, or a different guy, and it's awful, and how do we get out of this vicious cycle? So yeah, this is definitely going to be the shortest section because I get very heated on the subject. Just kidding. I'm cool as a breeze. There are some really fantastic examples in both the wrestling community and the church community in Nacho Libre. Starting with the church community, he wants more responsibilities or just like straight up better responsibilities. He has been on the same duty since he was like 12, if you follow the movie quite literally, and is just like, I, I just, I don't want to make this crappy soup anymore. Um, and I completely get that. I don't think anyone could physically be in the same position doing the same thing for that long at such a, a pivotal moment or time in their life. Nacho's boss does give him a added responsibility in taking care of, like, sick people, but this isn't really, I don't think, at all what Nacho wanted. I do think he just wanted more respect and maybe even just better food to cook and offer because he's not making anyone's day with the crap he was serving and he was aware of it. If I was in his position, honestly, I would feel really bad too in that I would want to do something about the crappy food I'm serving. Even if I'm making better food, I'm all of a sudden in a better position because people will respect you and think nice of you and then you're making everyone's day. Suddenly you're at the top of the hierarchy. Like, 
Nacho had a plan all along, man. He knew what was up. <laughs> In the wrestling side of the story here, it is a little bit unfortunate um, because he and his partner in crime are at the bottom of the barrel when it comes to the wrestling hierarchy. Unfortunately, no one really like likes them, but it's not no one. It's only the guys they want to like them. And this is the unfortunate thing. They got tunnel vision in where they, they their their aspirations lie almost. But truly, they go to the guys party, the bad guys party, and both in their own very special right get shat on. And it's unfortunate that people want to put other people in their place, you know, quote unquote. But this is, again, the iron law of oligarchy. This isn't uh, Burke's doing. Um, is, uh, I forget who wrote that one. But it is nearly a proven science that humans are awful. And they'll always want to be bigger than the next guy. Again, I should keep this one short so I don't get heated. Let's move on to the fifth and final and most exciting one. Humans are rotten with perfection. In Burke's essay, he points to everything having the ability to have a perfection or a perfect level, including villains or fools or, you know, anything bad. You can always have a perfect bad thing because again in nature bad doesn't exist and so the most perfect tornado could also be the most deadly thing in the world in the sense of christianity and celebrities and false pride i think greed would be the utmost perfection of what the worst potentiality could be and luckily, there is a bit of a teeter-totter with this one. Unfortunately, it goes down before it goes up, but that is how most movies work, so can't blame them. But after first getting a bit of riches, Nacho Libre looks at the most delicious meats and thinks, should I get these for the orphans and the children and make the most delicious meal? No, I should get that outfit over there. I would look good. And, you know, it's not my colors, but he looks pretty, pretty damn good. <laughs> but he, cho he chose to go with greed over benevolence and, you know, whatever giving would be. Like, there, there's a proper word for that, right? But on the turn of this teeter-totter going from up to down... After showing off his rockin' buns and his rockin' outfit to the hot nun, <laughs> shouldn't say that, he does make a turn of heart. The end, end, end of the movie is truly rotten with perfection. In the good way, luckily. So not that we completely get the girl, we do win the match, the wrestling match against the bad guy who's got the super big muscles in the most epic way ever. I have to also admit it's a very, very epic win. Out of the fantastic potentialities, this is the golden boy of all of them, um, to which only happens in, in comedy movies like this. It never happens in real life, but we win the match, we buy the orphans a bus for trips, and then we take the greatest vacation of all time in the most beautiful new outfit with the girl and the orphans, aka we're back in church and everybody wins. Everybody wins. But unfortunately, life does not work out this way. This is the absolute golden boy of potentialities and way this story could go, but it is not truly how often life does turn out. And this is unfortunate, but it is something we all need to accept. 
you know, we can work toward our ultimate goal, but we gotta be okay if we don't get there, you know what I'm saying? We just do. We do. Um, but with that, I have to read you the final conclusion that Kenneth Burke provides. The conclusion of Burke's definition of man articulates the concepts with an old nursery rhyme, which he uses and then reuses to completely help you understand everything in the most beautiful way. So, dig in. If all of the trees were one tree, what a great tree that would be. If all the axes were one axe, what a great axe that would be. If all the men were one man, what a great man he would be. And if all the seas were one sea, what a great sea that would be. And if the great man took the great axe and chopped down the great tree and let it fall into the great sea, what a splish splash that would be. And so for Burke, the modernized and perfected version goes as thus. If all the thermonuclear warheads were one thermonuclear warhead, what a great thermonuclear warhead that would be. If all the intercontinental ballistic missiles were one intercontinental ballistic missile, what a great intercontinental ballistic missile that would be. If all the military men were one military man, what a great military man he would be. And if all the land masses were one land mass, what a great land mass that would be. And if the great military man took the great thermonuclear warhead and put it into the great intercontinental ballistic missile and dropped it onto the great land mass, what a great progress that would be. You know the game Risk? Risk is a game with two to six players where all of them fight to the death and take over all of the land. Not to the death, but you'd be surprised to hear it's based off of a map of the planet Earth. And so largely, Risk, the game, is a symbol for war with winners and losers, sometimes just good and bad luck, but truly is a tool to learn about combative strategies and tactics, and in the end, the winners will either lose or the losers will either win, leaving just one man standing. And this is something that we have to face in our daily lives. I don't want to talk too much about it, but we don't want to be perfect. We want a fun, happy game of Risk where two to six players can share the board. But this isn't the game. We want one man standing. And this is not dissimilar to capitalism and the reason why monopolies are illegal. But you know, monopoly is another game. Just another children's Hasbro game. I don't know if it's Hasbro. Just another game where one person takes over the entire world. The game of Risk and Burke's poem are really one and the same, and the game of Monopoly is one and the same. One winner ruling the entire world, and maybe in a sort of total destruction sort of way. So, just something to think about. The games we play surely feed into the nature of our rotten perfection, and damn do I love to play them so much. What is it? What, what is it? It's the human condition. But truly, we all want to live to our utmost rottenest, and maybe if we feed this feeling with games, we will suffer just a little bit less. But I don't think so. And that's a totally different conversation. <laughs> but the largest moral of this story is what perfection are we gearing ourselves up for? 
The true moral of the story here is to look at ourselves and understand what direction we're heading and the perfection it's is at the end of that because we don't want to stop and take a minute and realize oh I'm heading in the direction of utmost evil that's the perfection of what I want right now like capitalists what is the perfection what is the actual reason what are you doing I'm just saying we got to stop and cool it or else we're just playing the games and only one person can win. I, I literally did a drawing about this like two years ago. The games need to end. That's all. But it's not all. I got a whole nother section here. <laughs> In the end, if we know more about the human condition, or at least the Burke's definition of man version of the human condition, can we relieve our suffering? I've said it a thousand times and I cannot say it enough, but we truly do have to rewrite our brains. We have to rewrite what suffering is, what bad things are, and maybe even what perfection is. Does perfection look like, you know, the most pristine house, a white kitchen? Or is it something a little bit more realistic and human and relatable? This is something we have to give ourselves in order to not feel insecure, in order to not suffer, in order to not build the completely wrong expectations for ourselves and just let ourselves down. Let ourselves down. We don't want to do that. Of course, and again, we do have to have a drive and a will to power and, you know, a vision of our potential and what that perfection could be. But again, just understanding the reality of correct expectations or maybe just like not being a sore loser when your expectations aren't met, this is what will relieve suffering. And this is the aspect of understanding our human condition can help us in relieving our suffering. It's unfortunate, but it's true. And as I always say, a helping hand can be so much easier than rewriting your brain for yourself. I am not a therapist, I am only a philosopher and public relations specialist. But on that note, I do want to shout one last thing in that Kenneth Burke is a literary theorist. He is not a philosopher, so to speak. You know, I call him a philosopher, but he's not. So I think we could potentially add a sixth element onto the definition of man, which is... We are limited by time and ourselves. And this is because I see a lot of our suffering from our limitation, our death, our mortality. And if Kenneth Berg had added this element to his paper, it would have been from 25 pages to like 3,000 words. So I completely understand. But I do think that this is the following step in why we want to be perfect and why it also leads to our suffering just because we die we do have a limited time on the earth and how can we make it perfect if we are obstructed by so many more people and time and everything and that in and of itself too feeds our suffering Truly, my thesis in my, you know, uh, senior thesis is we are too limited and how can we be free to even attempt perfection? If we're so limited, we can't. And so our suffering will just burn inside of us forever. But that's, that's my theory in so little words. Anyways... Now I have to admit, I've been wanting to make a video on this theory for the longest of times. 
Uh, but I'm really glad I hadn't until now because my video quality will just only go up. And when I learned about it, my video quality was like really low. So I'm, I'm so glad and thank you for your patience. But I have to share with you the example that my professor shared with me when teaching this in class. So before I go, here's just one last thing to think about. The rotten perfection of an acorn is an oak tree. However, the rotten perfection of your hypothetical daughter going on a date with like some random guy ends with drug, sex, and alcohol, and rock and roll, and in the worst case scenario ever. So, while there's only one direction for perfection in nature, Perfection in humans can go in any direction, and apparently our parents will always assume the worst of us and just see the utmost perfection in its rottenest of forms. So, burn, parents. I'm doing great now. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, but yeah, that's, that's all from me from today. I, I hope you enjoyed it. <laughs>